a word in your ear. Yes, sir. Now, it's about this AGM. Ah, yes. I was hoping we could count on your two votes for Gwen. You're going to have to wait for the outcome there, old son. It's a matter between a man's conscience and the ballot box, as it were. Hmm. Well, may the best woman win, yep. Yes. I hope your charming wife appreciates how much you're putting yourself out. Or is this another one of your, um, <laughs> dark secrets? El Dorado, tomorrow at 7 on BBC One. Tonight, unemployment rises again in the East Midlands. We report on the human cost. Plus the new scheme which gives police officers more time with their families. And a thrilling victory for Leicestershire, through for the first time to the NatWest Trophy final. Join us at 6.30. Gorton and Simpson are responsible for the screenplay of Two's film comedy shortly with Lawrence Harvey, the spy with a cold nose. This is BBC One. Six o'clock news from the BBC with John Humphreys and Andrew Harvey. Good evening. The headlines at six o'clock. The International Red Cross has called for an end to the abuse of innocent civilians in the Yugoslav war. They say they have evidence of systematic brutality on all sides. The London bomb plot that went wrong when the IRA tried to buy a van. Another 29,000 joined the job queues. It's the highest total for five years. And President Bush calls in James Baker to rescue his campaign. The International Red Cross has accused the warring factions in Bosnia of using systematic brutality against innocent civilians. It said Serbs, Muslims and Croats were all guilty of so-called ethnic cleansing, forcing people to move out of their homes. And in Geneva, the United Nations Human Rights Commission has been holding an unprecedented emergency session to examine evidence of atrocities by all sides. The Americans want a special investigation to decide whether war crimes are being committed. In New York, the United Nations Security Council is meeting now to consider the use of military force to protect convoys delivering aid in Bosnia. A decision is expected tonight. With the world now listening at the highest level, the Croats came prepared with evidence of alleged mass killings. It's the Bosnians, though, who have most to gain. As you know, the ethnic cleansing and concentration camps are reality in Bosnia-Herzegovina. The aggression is destroying our country, so we hope that this meeting will help us to stop the aggression. Even the Bosnian Serbs were represented. Officially, they have no right to be here, although in reality, they hold 70% of Bosnia. The Americans want to reverse that. Their ambassador here, in the New World Order, a friend of the Russian ambassador, was a member of the Nuremberg War Crimes Tribunal after the Second World War. He drafted the resolution proposed today by a government minister. The policy which its perpetrators chillingly call ethnic cleansing is an abhorrent breach of international human rights standards, as well as the norms of civilized behavior. The resolution warns of possible war crimes trials and calls for the release of civilians and immediate access to all detention camps, with a special UN investigator appointed to report on abuses within two weeks. The Bosnians speak of systematic torture and mass executions. Women are raped and mutilated. Serbian symbols are carved on their bodies. Mass executions are routine. There are hundreds of massive graves. The Drina River is full of blood. But the Serb who's taken Yugoslavia's seat here says there are no concentration camps in Bosnia. To our best knowledge, there existed only prisoners of war camps where 8,251 persons were detained and not 58,810, as alleged by the Muslim side. There were no women and children among the prisoners. But also in Geneva today, the Red Cross issued an unusually strong statement condemning ethnic cleansing. Neither in Africa nor in Asia or elsewhere in Latin America, we have observed such a systematic and total uh, disrespect and violation of all and any international humanitarian rule uh, in a conflict. 
The Serbs, although not condemned by name in this UN resolution, are now clearly in the dock of world opinion. They may be winning the war on the ground, but they've lost this round of the propaganda war. David Loyne, BBC News, Geneva. In New York, members of the UN Security Council are considering resolutions which would allow military protection for humanitarian convoys and would give the Red Cross full access to all detention camps in Bosnia. It's taken a week of negotiation to get this far, but at last the Security Council has arrived at the decision no one really wanted to take, allowing the use of force, in diplomatic terms, all necessary means to get relief supplies through in safety. I don't want to go into the details about how it will be done. Uh, that will all have to be followed up after the resolution has been adopted. But just remember this, this is not a resolution which is prescribing the use of force, it is merely a resolution which is authorizing it as a last resort. While diplomats here say it's impossible to predict whether their resolution would have any immediate effect, the Bosnians claim the United Nations is missing the point. What they really need, they say, are weapons to defend themselves. I think there are some that are uh, more inclined to deal with uh, band-aid approaches and I'm afraid that these approaches may end up with the um, patient on the operating table supposedly to help him but eventually dismembered. With the Red Cross accusing all sides in the conflict of breaking the Geneva Convention, the Security Council is hoping that just the threat of military intervention will bring some sense of reason to the combatants in the Balkans. Bill Turnbull, BBC News, New York. United Nations officials say they bought more time from the Serbian forces who were threatening to expel 28,000 people from northern Bosnia. But there are continuing reports of harassment of civilians. One official compared their treatment to that of the Jews in Nazi Germany. From Zagreb, Alan Little reports. Waiting to be cleansed, the Muslims of Sanski Most are flying white flags from their homes. For the UN official who witnessed it, the symbolism could not be more stark. Uh, the local Serbian official said it was a sign of loyalty, but it's clear it's a sign of, of subservience. Uh, and uh, it was reminiscent of, say, you know, uh, Jewish stars in World War II or pink triangles under the Nazis. It was shocking that the, the local authorities have just put out the word that you put up a white flag or your home is going to be cleansed. Many homes have been cleansed already. Those Muslims who remain are frightened and want to leave. We are all out of work. We have no money. We are hungry. We live in fear. There is curfew. We're not allowed out after 8 p.m. Nobody told us straight to leave, but we have been forced by all means. The UNHCR stumbled on a detention camp here, small, obscurely located and hitherto unknown. Local people said there were about 200 men being held there. Their families were allowed to take them food. The Serbian guards did not enjoy the attention they attracted. There's another small camp in the village of Ripach. This woman's 35-year-old son is being held there. No one knows how many small local camps there are. But even if the Red Cross gains access to the larger ones, these will remain outside the reach of international inspection. The Yugoslav Prime Minister Milan Panic has left Sarajevo, having failed to meet the man he'd gone to see, the Bosnian president. Earlier, an American journalist travelling in Mr Panic's convoy was shot dead by a sniper on the road from the airport to the city. The British Foreign Minister Douglas Hogg was also in Sarajevo today, making preparations for the London Peace Conference later this month. The momentum of war in Bosnia has defeated every attempt to start a realistic peace process. Douglas Hogg came here to prepare for the latest last chance, a peace conference to be held in London this month. The visit made it clearer than ever that Mr Hogg and his colleagues will have to work diplomatic miracles to save the London conference from failure. Oh, is this for the benefit of the television? Yeah, it's true. Well, it's very nice Alia Izetbegovic, the Bosnian president, is not interested in compromise. He believes his people are fighting for their lives. He's often compared their position to Britain's in 1940. President Izetbegovic wants decisive foreign intervention or heavy weapons. They showed Mr. Hogg the damage Serbian shelling has done to the Bosnian government's headquarters, but Mr. Hogg told them they wouldn't get what they wanted. I explained very clearly to them that there was no cavalry over the hill. There is no international force coming to stop this. That being so, in the absence of discussions and a ceasefire, 
the killing will go on. And I made that very plain to the president, and I believe he understood it. But after he left, the Bosnians repeated their opposition to any direct negotiations with the Serbs who are besieging the city. The problem is that Mr. Hogg wants the Muslim-led Bosnian presidency to negotiate with Serbs they regard as war criminals. The Bosnians ask why they should trust people who shell civilians in Sarajevo and who are trying to drive Muslims out of large areas of the Republic. There was another attempt at dialogue in Sarajevo today which went disastrously wrong. Milan Panic, Prime Minister of the state which now calls itself Yugoslavia, invited himself to the city. An American journalist traveling with Mr. Panic was killed by a sniper. These are crippled people, mentally ill, killing people like this. Do you think you will ever... Mr. Panic wasn't received by the Bosnian president, a fact he denied. He did not refuse to see me. Please, stop. This is a very touchy moment for you and you are not going to provoke me without... Foolish question. Before today, Mr. Panic wasn't taken very seriously as a peacemaker. He has even less credibility now. Jeremy Bowen, BBC News, Sarajevo. Now other news. A tip-off from a member of the public has helped to stop an IRA bombing campaign in central London. It's understood that five people are now being questioned at a top security police station as a result of the raids on homes around London on Tuesday. Explosives and bomb-making equipment were seized. The anti-terrorist raids on a flat at Chesant in Hertfordshire and a house at Hanwell in West London were the culmination of a major police operation which officers say has thwarted a terrorist bombing campaign. Sources say a so-called active service unit of the IRA was preparing for a new wave of attacks. No bombs had been made up and speculation that a van containing explosives is still missing has been ruled out. Anti-terrorist sources say they received a vital tip-off from a member of the public who became suspicious about someone trying to buy a van with cash. That information tied in with a long-term police intelligence operation. And in the raids that followed, a substantial haul of homemade explosives was recovered, which terrorists had intended for use against targets in London. It emerged today that a third raid took place at this house at Southall in West London, where two women were arrested. Neighbours say police moved in after a surveillance operation lasting several days from an empty house opposite. They took about three, four attempts to break the door down. Yeah, and then I um, uh, just heard some woman scream and then they started clearing out the area as well. Did you see the women brought out? Yes, yeah, or two of them. They were wearing sort of nightgowns and that at the time. It's believed that three men and two women are being detained at the top security Paddington Green Police Station under the Prevention of Terrorism Act. Police are urging the public to remain vigilant and to report anything suspicious. The continuing investigation stems from inquiries into the bombing of the Baltic Exchange in the City of London in April when three people died and another bomb near the junction of the M1 and the North Circular. In both cases the bombs were planted in vans and it's possible that terrorists had been planning similar attacks this time. There's been another rise in unemployment. Today's increase brings the total to the highest for five years. More than two and three quarter million people were unemployed and claiming benefit in July. That's up just over 29,000 after seasonal adjustments. Our economics correspondent Steve Levinson reports. For 22-year-old Sean McCarthy, this has become a ritual. Like others up and down the country today, he has to queue to sign up as unemployed. It's a vivid reminder that unemployment is still growing. The latest increase was the 27th in a row. Sean lost his job 18 months ago. I was working as a waiter at the time in a hotel here in London. Um, since then I haven't had anything. Um, I keep hoping, but I don't expect anything in the very near future. Gillian Shepherd, the employment secretary, has the unenviable task of stemming the jobless tide. Today she was presenting a certificate to the 50,000th person to find work through one of her department's job schemes and explaining why unemployment's still rising. At this stage, you naturally expect there to be some months with good news and some months with less good news. And of course, the overall uh, trend in increase in unemployment is still down. So to that extent, it is encouraging. But I wouldn't want to minimise in any way uh, the effect that unemployment has on individuals and on their families. But Labour thinks Mrs Shepherd should be doing much more. 
she should call an emergency meeting of the European Employment Ministers and say, look, we've got 16 million people unemployed in the European community. We ought to be putting together a package that gets down interest rates, increases investment and gets Europe back to work. Unemployment has risen in many countries in the current recession. Two years ago, Britain's unemployment rate was well below that of France, below the European community average and not far above America's. Since then, however, while rising unemployment has been an international phenomenon, Britain's rate has climbed more steeply than elsewhere. Other figures today confirm the squeeze on industry continues. Although output rose slightly in June, the longer term trend is still flat. Wages are growing at their slowest rate for 25 years. On the government's unemployment count, the total has now passed two and three quarter million. But it is rising more slowly than before at around 20,000 a month recently, as against 40,000 a month at the start of the year. But it remains to be seen whether this improvement will be maintained. Now there's growing evidence that business confidence has fallen back during the summer. The ferry on which two children died after breathing in sewage fumes is back in service and returning to Swansea. Irish government official gave the Celtic pride the go-ahead to leave Cork this morning. Engineers worked through the night to make the modifications which had been ordered by accident investigators. The Celtic Pride was allowed back into service for this morning's crossing, but the cabin where the two children died was sealed off, along with the three cabins nearest to it. The Irish investigators confirmed that the children had been killed by noxious fumes escaping from their toilet. But since the tragedy, a number of passengers have stepped forward, claiming that there had been strong sewage smells on the ship on previous crossings. One passenger said he'd noticed fumes on both legs of his journey and had made several complaints. On the return trip, there were two cabins, cabin 14 and cabin 2 on aid deck, that, that had fumes in them. Not as strong as, uh, as the trip uh, coming from Swansea, but, but very definitely there. Investigators insist the sewage system on the ship is safe, although it uses older flush-style toilets rather than the modern vacuum type. The system on the Celtic Pride is the older gravity system, similar to what you'd have ashore. Uh, that doesn't necessarily mean there's anything wrong with it, it's just it's, a, it's an older system. The investigators add there may have to be further modifications to the vessel once their report is complete. In the meantime, they insist they would not let the ship sail if they believed any passenger was in danger. Later in this news, phantom cash machine withdrawals. The banks say they're not to blame, but the customers say they are, and they're suing the banks. And problems for the football club, which turns drug addicts into soccer players. Now the time is 16 minutes past six. Main story is this evening, the International Red Cross has accused all sides in Bosnia of using systematic brutality against innocent civilians. It's emerged that a tip-off from a member of the public helped anti-terrorist officers prevent a new IRA bombing campaign in London. Unemployment has gone up for the 27th month in a row. After seasonal adjustments, just over 29,000 more people were out of work. The American Secretary of State James Baker is resigning in order to take charge of President Bush's flagging re-election campaign. He's to become the new White House Chief of Staff in 10 days' time. His deputy, Lawrence Eagleburger, will take over as Acting Secretary of State. Mr. Baker said it was one of the hardest decisions of his life. In what opponents call a panic measure, Mr. Bush has moved his best friend and longtime confidant from control of foreign policy to the White House. I've asked Secretary Baker to resign as Secretary of State to join me as Chief of Staff and Senior Counselor to the President, effective August 23rd. He's the sort of man you want on your team. As the third Bush Chief of Staff in the past year, James Baker's main task will be to ensure Mr. Bush's election victory as he did in 1988. Today, he tacitly admitted Bush foreign policy successes were at the expense of ignoring domestic affairs. Some will ask why President Bush spent so much time on foreign policy during his first term. And here's my reply. Over the past four years, more of our fellow human beings have gained their freedom than in than any other time in human history. And we have permanently turned back the hands of the nuclear doomsday clock. 
No apologies for that. It's time now to turn to new challenges to the future, at home and abroad. And that's exactly what President Bush intends to do. Last December, as his popularity fell, Mr. Bush replaced Chief of Staff John Sununu with Samuel Skinner. But under Skinner, White House management became so confused, insiders called it Noah's Ark. We've got two of everything in here, they said. Mr. Baker orchestrated the Middle East peace process, steered through the collapse of communism and the Gulf crisis. Now Western diplomats privately speak of their fear of drift over Bosnia, the Middle East and other flashpoints. In making James Baker his chief of staff, Mr. Bush has recognized the problem is not simply with his campaign, but with the direction of the presidency itself. When the history of election 92 is written, this will be seen either as the last gamble of a declining president or as the day on which George Bush became the comeback kid. Gavin Esler, BBC News, Washington. The African National Congress has rejected outright a proposal by the South African government for a general amnesty for all those who have carried out political crimes, including members of the security forces. The Foreign Minister, Pick Butter, had said it was the only way in which South Africa could bury the past. Mr. Butter said the government also agreed in principle to an independent inquiry into the country's armed groups, which would include the army and the police. The release of prisoners from the notorious Robben Island. Over a thousand political prisoners have been freed by the declared government in the past two years. The most famous jailed for 27 years, prisoner number 466-64, stroke Nelson Mandela. Since then, the ANC has campaigned for the release of more than 400 others and made their release a precondition for restarting talks with the government on political reform. Now, following the UN's intervention, the government has agreed to free them. But there's a strict condition. Those who committed crimes whilst in the service of the state, including members of the security forces, should also escape prosecution. If you want to bury the past, you've got to do so properly. You can't say 400 uh, ANC prisoners must be released and then don't do it for everyone else. It doesn't matter which organization you serve. The government is arguing for indemnity from prosecution for anyone willing to confess in confidence. Nelson Mandela, eager to accelerate the political reform process, might have been tempted to agree. But with more radical supporters demanding justice and revenge after years of oppression, the ANC leadership decided tonight to reject the government's attempt to link the release of political prisoners with a general amnesty covering the security forces, especially after the Boipatong massacre. And we don't think that it is appropriate for a government which still perpetrates some of the crimes it wants to get amnesty on uh, to pardon itself. And we think that it belongs to, to an interim government to do so. This government is proposing something that will enable it to forgive itself for its actions. I don't think they have that right. Six years ago, Paula McBride's husband, Robert, an ANC activist, was jailed for murdering three women and injuring 89 others after planting a bomb outside a Durban bar. Now, his release could well be delayed if the government and the ANC once again remain deadlocked. John Harrison, BBC News, Johannesburg. Thirteen people who say they're the victims of bogus withdrawals from cash machines are suing a number of banks and building societies. Writs were issued in the High Court today. Hundreds of customers are claiming that money has been taken from their accounts without their cash point cards. But the banks insist that that's impossible. Our legal correspondent Joshua Rosenberg reports. Jane Bath was working as a veterinary assistant when she opened an account at her local branch of Lloyds Bank in 1988. The bank gave her a cash point card and a personal identification number so she could get money from cash dispensers. But when Jane Bath checked her statement, she found that somebody had withdrawn a total of £365 from her account. She says it wasn't her, but the bank wouldn't believe her. They just practically accused me, said that I'd given the card, I must have given the card to someone else. You know, I must have told someone my PIN number and it, I, I, I'd made the withdrawals nobody else had. And how did you feel about that? I felt very annoyed and very angry. Dennis Woolley is a Merseyside solicitor. He's acting for Jane Bath and some 250 other people who say they're the victims of what are called phantom withdrawals. They're suing their respective banks and building societies because they believe that the financial institutions have broken the contracts they made with their customers. 
For 25 years, customers have been complaining of problems with cash dispensing machines. For 25 years, the banks have been denying that there is a problem. I now intend to prove that there is a problem and I want to get damages for these people who've been cheated. All cash and credit cards carry account details in a magnetic strip. It's claimed anyone with the right equipment can copy someone else's details onto a blank card and they can get PIN numbers by looking over people's shoulders. But the banks say their systems are secure and they've introduced a new code of practice which says the customer will only have to pay any losses if the bank can prove he's negligent. But they say that won't apply to existing cases. I wouldn't think that they would want to go that far because they have formed a judgment at that time on the evidence available and that evidence that somebody had used the card has been uh, supported um, by their own inquiries and by the proper complaints procedures. This is one battle that the banks have got to fight, otherwise they'll be opening the door to widespread fraud. A new report on Strangeways Prison in Manchester has warned that there will be more problems there if conditions aren't improved. The Chief Inspector of Prisons, Judge Stephen Tumim, says despite a £60 million rebuilding programme at the jail, the security is oppressive both mentally and physically. The Home Office has accepted that unconvicted prisoners need to be better treated. Strangeways is undergoing a massive rebuilding program, but although it's already brought some improvement in inmates' living conditions, the report says it hasn't achieved an equivalent improvement in the daily regime. Awesome security measures were in force, with some prisoners in their cells for more than 20 hours a day, often looking forward to slopping out as a welcome release from prison cell boredom. Many staff agree that the regime is particularly tough on remand prisoners, but believe it'll all change when new amenities are opened. The security in there is phenomenal at the moment, but do we need to spend another £83 million after a riot? I think it's right the building should be protected. We should never ever experience a riot like we had at Strange Days before, and I could guarantee with the new security, a riot of that nature will not happen in Manchester. That optimism isn't shared by the inspectors, and at least one recent remand prisoner thinks trouble could be brewing again unless internal restrictions are eased. I think it will, it will, there will be another kickoff. It might not be as big, but there will be a kickoff if it carries on the way it is. Because it is, it, if, when you walk in there now, it feels like it's calm. But behind the doors, you can tell it's not calm because everyone's moaning about the, the state of the prison. So it could do. The Home Office say things have improved since the riot, but agree that much more needs to be done. After the rebuilding, Private security firms are to be invited to bid against the prison service for the contract to run Strangeways. Whether the competition will improve the regime remains to be seen. Carlton Athletic Football Club in Glasgow may have to close because it's run out of money. It's not an ordinary football club, its members were all drug addicts and it's helped more than 600 people overcome their addiction. The club's success inspired a BBC television drama. To members of Glasgow's Carlton Athletic, football is more than a game, it's a lifeline to a drugs-free future. But team membership comes at an uncompromising price, sudden and complete withdrawal. Doing cold turkey, as they call it, is the hardest part of the recovery programme, but addicts who stay for three months are awarded the club's coveted red T-shirt in recognition of their progress. I feel really worn out, so the, the first I had that, I had Are you going to stay the course? Yeah. Yeah, I want one of them t-shirts. I want one of these red t-shirts. Yeah. get them after three months and I'm going to get myself one. The club's success in helping more than 600 addicts to complete recovery provided the inspiration for a BBC television drama starring Lenny Henry and Robbie Coltrane. Get up, Alan! Come on, Alan. But two weeks ago, the real Carlton Athletic ran out of money and was forced to close. The club receives only limited funding from its local health board and Strathclyde Regional Council. Emergency handouts have kept it going. I think it's disgraceful that they should, anyone should even think of, uh, of closing uh, such an organisation. The fact speaks for itself. It's very, very effective. It's, it's effective in the sense that it gets people off drugs and it's effective in the sense that it does it very cheaply and on no account should it be closed. Social work officials can't guarantee the club money, but say they do want it to continue. In a city with 12,000 injecting drug abusers, around 2% of the young adult population, Carlton Athletics services are considered vital. But supporters say that without the extra money, there'll be no future for the club or the addicts who depend on it for recovery. 
And that was the 6 o'clock news today, Thursday, August the 13th. All the groups involved in the fighting in Bosnia have been accused of treating people cruelly. The International Committee of the Red Cross said its observers had evidence of the systematic use of brutality. And that's it for now. More news at 9, but from Andrew and me for the moment, good evening. A very good evening to you. It's been another very wet day over many central and southern parts of the country, all due, in fact, to this low-pressure area here. And at the moment, it's sitting in southeastern parts of Wales. It's going to track its way southeastwards across southern parts of England, uh, getting into Belgium, I think, before the end of the night, and then pulling in these uh, northerly winds, much clearer uh, northerly winds coming down across the country later on. The rainfall then, shown by the radar, uh, got its northern limit across Wales, up nearly towards the Manchester area, southern parts of Lincolnshire, and shown by the different colours, there were some pulses of pretty heavy rain, some nasty driving conditions at the moment over central and southern parts with some uh, local flooding. Now we're starting to see some clearer weather coming in. Winds too, quite strong. The strongest of the winds at the moment are down near the uh, Channel coasts. The strongest wind shown by the large arrows pushing across into northern France in the next few hours as these lighter northerlies come in and those lighter northerlies likely to stay there right the way through tomorrow. So then, this is the rainfall picture at the moment, just clearing western parts of Wales. That clearer weather coming right across the southern parts uh, through tonight, clearing the extreme southeast. I would think about 4 or 5 o'clock uh, tomorrow morning. And then, as you can see, a few mist and fog patches likely in the wetter parts of the West Midlands as that rain clears away. And a pretty cold night in the north, uh, around about 4 degrees. So ending up a dry night, ending up a clear night with those mist and fog patches around. That's the weather map for tomorrow. This warm front, I think, extremely extremely weak. The main feature is this little ridge of high pressure pushing its way in. So a much brighter day for most of us tomorrow. Most of us, in fact, seeing a reasonable amount of sunshine, not unbroken sunshine by any means, but a good deal of sunshine. Just a small chance, uh, and only a small one, about a 20% chance of a shower coming onto that northeast coast of England, perhaps over onto the Norfolk coast as well. Much greater chance, in fact, of getting them along the northern coast of Holland. But with the sunshine, with the lighter winds, it's certainly going to feel warmer. Uh, temperatures up as high as 21 degrees, probably 19 in southern parts of Scotland, 14 up in the far north. And then on Saturday, down over England and Wales, still dry with some sunshine, much more in the way of cloud, though, further north with a bit of rain. That's the way the weather looks. Bye-bye.